You're listening to Brains On, where we're serious about being curious. Brains On is supported in part by a grant from the National Science Foundation. We're coming to you live, backstage at The Chirp, the nation's only birdsong competition. I'm your host, Scotty Warbler. Everyone is looking fantastic. Sleek feathers, shiny beaks, flocks of talent, all in one room. I'm here now with beloved judge, Ren Stefani. Ren, what are you excited to see from our contestants tonight? Well, last week, Doja Catbird absolutely killed it with her pop version of Tweet Child of Mine. She's going to have to really fly the extra mile to top that. And I think Elvin and the Chirp Monks will do well if they can stop squabbling and work together as a group. They've been fighting over the bowl of bugs in their dressing room all afternoon. Oh, well, we'll see if those birds of a feather can pull it together. Thanks, Ren. And now over to fan favorite, Tweeta Aura. How are you feeling about competing tonight? Oh my gosh, Scotty, I was so nervous this morning. I thought I was going to totally barf worms. But I got the best pep talk from my coach, Kelly Larkson. She's been such an inspiration to me. She reminded me that I was born to sing. Amazing. Well, we're all excited to hear you knock your performance out of the nest tonight. And here are Meg and Jack Shrike of the White Shrikes. Great to see you both. I loved your version of Rockin' Robin. It was a totally rad remix. Thanks so much, Scotty. We were inspired by classic squawk and roll groups like the Tweedles, the Moody Bluebirds, Cheap Trick, and of course, the Birds. We love giving the audience something they can really shake a tail feather to. Well, all my tail feathers are ready to rock. And now, it's time for... You're listening to Brains On from APM Studios. I'm Molly Bloom, and my co-host today is Bessie from Hudson, New York. Hi, Bessie. Hi, Molly. Today we're talking about songbirds and the sounds they make, and you had a question about that, right? Yeah, I wanted to know how songbirds communicate with each other. Do they have a certain chirp for every word? This is a great question, and I can't wait to answer it, so... Let's get pumped up by starting with some bird facts. Chirp, chirp, y'all. Bring on those facts. Fact. Not all birds are songbirds. Fact. Songbirds have special toes that help them perch on branches. Fact. They have cool muscles in their throats that give them really precise control of their tweets. Fact. And that's why they can produce such cool sounds. Whew, those were great facts. You really know your stuff. So, Bessie, I'm wondering, do you have lots of birds singing where you live? Um, yes, a bunch of different kinds. Can you recognize the different kinds by the songs? Yeah, a couple of them. So what is your favorite one that you can recognize? Um, the morning dove. I actually know how to do that. I would love to hear that. Hoo, 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 hoo. Oh, yeah, I've heard that one before. I love that. That was really good. My favorite one to do is the chickadee. Go, chickadee dee 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 dee. That one's fun because you just say chickadee and then say dee a lot. <laughs> do you want to try it? <laughs> yeah. Chickadee dee 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 dee. Nice. Very good. So, if you were a bird, what do you think your song would sound like? I don't know. <laughs> well, okay, here's an idea. So, since, you know, the chickadee. Its call is its name. Is there a call based on your name, like the Bessie call? Like, so mine is Molly. My name is Molly. I think I have a loud laugh sometimes. So I think it would be Molly. <laughs> Molly. <laughs> How was that? <laughs> that was silly. Okay, now your turn. I think I think it just say my name. Okay, let me hear. Like. Bessie, 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 Bessie. I love it. (laughs) That's great. Well, to help answer your questions, we have Kristen Brunk here. She's a scientist who studies birds and their songs. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Bessie. Hi, Molly. Do songbirds have a different chirp for every word? Songbirds, when they interact, it's not exactly the same way that humans have a word for everything that we want to say. 
there's a lot of information that's contained in bird songs, but they're not necessarily using words like people do. Birds make all kinds of sounds when they're communicating, and there's sort of two main types that we split them into. The longer, more complex ones we tend to call songs, and the shorter, simpler, really quick, rapid-fire ones we tend to call calls. Oh, okay, so the noises that this water thrush is making would be a call. So what's something that a bird can say with a call? Calls are used for such a wide variety of things. It might be mates communicating with one another about where they are while they're foraging. It might be an alarm call where a bird is trying to indicate that there's a predator nearby or some other sort of danger. Okay, let's hear what a gray catbird sounds like when it sees a threat. So calls are used for a much wider variety of things than, than songs are. Calls are sort of a year-round, anytime, because birds are always communicating with one another, with other members of their species, or potentially with members of other species. So bird calls are a little like text messages. Very cool. What about their songs? Songs tend to be, at least in the northern hemisphere, they tend to be really focused in the breeding season. Um, and so in the northern hemisphere, that's in the summer Some of the birds down in the Southern Hemisphere will sing year-round. They'll sing their songs year-round because they're defending those territories um, all throughout the year. So it really just depends what they're trying to say and who they're trying to say it to. This yellow warbler sure has a lot to say. Let's hear it. So if bird calls are like texts, then bird songs are like male birds advertising all their best qualities to the ladybirds, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. They're indicating their quality to all of the females in the area. Um, but there, there are times off-season that birds are singing as well. And there's a couple ideas about why they could be singing in, in the non-breeding season. And one of them is just that they're potentially practicing and trying to get better for the next year. Um, because practice makes perfect, as we all know. And another sort of rising idea about why this is happening is that some birds actually, in the non-breeding season when they're singing, and a lot of these are social birds, things like European starlings. Ooh, let's hear a starling. They're actually singing because it's fun. They're getting sort of a a rush of chemicals to their brains when they're singing that is signaling them to continue singing. And so they're in the same way that when you sing in the shower, it's fun for you. Um, These birds are sort of having a good time out there singing, not really directed at anyone. They're sort of just singing off on their own, which is pretty cool and I think pretty relatable. Like this caller, Toei, keeping its tune fresh. Sing makes me happy too. But how do songbirds know what songs to sing? Do their parents teach them? That's such a great question. And it really depends on the bird. So some birds are sort of, they're they're hatched and they innately, we call it innate, which means it's sort of pre-programmed into them. Some species innately know their songs when they hatch. And others, most of them in this really large group of birds that we call the passerines. So they're the songbirds or the perching birds. And this is over half of the bird species that exist. Um, these guys actually have to learn their song through this whole sort of four-step process throughout their lives. They're learning what their voices sound like? So even with within an egg and soon after hatching, birds are listening to their parents singing or potentially making alarm calls. And just like when a human baby is born and they're listening to their parents speaking, this is sort of when the the nestling is learning the song template and kind of the the cadence of the song and what it sounds like. And then pretty soon after that, once young birds start to get a little bit bigger, once they start to leave the nest, they'll start kind of singing their own songs. And these, as you'd sort of expect, they have almost no practice. So they, they don't sound that good. 
they're really just sort of making noise, kind of like a, like a human baby babbling. Um, they're starting to make noises and learn what their own voice sounds like um, while still continuing to listen to their parents. Here's what a baby blue jay sounds like babbling. Wow, that baby bird was trying out a lot of different sounds. That's amazing. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Bessie. Thanks, Molly. It was great chatting with you guys. Bye, Kristen. Bye, Kristen. Speaking of sweet sounds, Bessie, how about we tweet ourselves to the... Bessie, are you ready to hear this mystery sound? Yes. Okay. Do you want to hear it again? Yeah. Okay, what do you think? Maybe like, um, part of it kind of sounds like a zipper. Ooh, I can hear that, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like something's going up and down, sort of. What else do you hear happening? Something, like, loud. Mm-hmm. Like, kind of, like, banging. So we think maybe zipper's a possibility. Any other possibilities, you think? Uh, maybe, like, a drill. Mm, interesting. Well, we're going to hear it again, get another chance to guess, and hear the answer after the credits. So stick around. <laughs> If you want to hear more fantastic bonus episodes like this every month, head to smartypass.org to subscribe. Smarty Pass fans also get ad-free episodes of all of our podcasts. That's Brains On, Smash Boom, Best Forever Ago, and Moment of Um, and other perks like discounts on events and merchandise. Plus, an exclusive thank you gift mailed straight to your home. Subscribing is only $3.99 a month or $36 for the whole year. Head to smartypass.org and thank you so much for supporting our show. You're listening to Brains On from APM Studios. I'm Bessie. And I'm Molly. So, it turns out you can't quite translate birdsong like you could another human language. Specific chirps aren't like specific words. They're more of a general feeling or vibe. But even so, can different species of birds understand each other's chirps? Like, can they get the basic idea of what another bird is communicating? Well, yes and no. Sometimes, when different bird species live in the same habitat, they learn to recognize specific kinds of sounds. So let me give you a human example to help me explain. So let's say you're in a new place and you don't speak the same language as the people around you, but you hear this. <laughs> what would that tell you? <laughs> that someone's happy. Mm -hmm. maybe someone's happy. Totally. And what if you hear this? What would that tell you? That, like, they're hurt or, like, scared. Mm-hmm, exactly. So birds can understand each other in that kind of basic way. For example, they remember the alarm calls of other bird species. So if a robin heard this from a blue jay, the robin might know that the blue jay is sending out an alarm call. Maybe the jay saw a hungry cat prowling around, or maybe it saw a snake. The robin wouldn't know for sure what scared the jay, but it would know to be careful. Are there other kinds of calls they might be able to recognize? Yeah, there are things like, you know, hey, that's my branch, go away. Or, ooh, some tasty bugs are over here. Since birds don't have a language like we do, they aren't exactly translating one another, but they can remember what happens when they hear a particular sound. So birds can understand some bird calls from other species if it's useful to them? Yes. Like how I know when Mark goes, oh, it means someone ate the last of his queso, and that someone was me. Does that come up very often? More than you'd think. Ugh, Molly! Oh, gotta go. Ha-ha! <laughs> So, birds can make sounds to let other birds know danger is nearby, to attract mates, or just they can make beautiful songs that make them feel good. 
But there are also some birds who are incredible mimics. You know, they can sound like other things. Scientists have found that nearly 300 bird species imitate sounds they hear. Some are songbirds, but other birds do it too. Mockingbirds can mimic all different kinds of sounds, like a lawnmower or a chainsaw. And there's an Australian species called the superb lyrebird that might be the champion of copycats. I mean, copy birds. These cheeky chirpers can imitate more than 20 different bird species in a single song. Sometimes mimic birds use their powers in super sneaky ways. For example, there's a songbird called the fork-tailed drongo that lives in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's really good at imitating other sounds. It uses its trickster abilities to score a quick meal. These drongos will listen to other songbirds and learn their alarm chirps. Then they'll wait until they see another bird about to pounce on a tasty bite, like bugs, worms, or lizards. That's when the drongo will sing a false alarm. When the other bird hears the alarm, they'll think there's danger, so they fly away, leaving their snacks behind for the drongo to scoop up. Mimics pick up all sorts of sounds, including ones made by humans. But that's not the only way we've affected the way songbirds communicate. Bird songs are actually changing, and humans are part of the reason why. Humans are noisy. We use machines with loud engines. We do construction work with loud tools. We have loud concerts. And over time, cities have gotten noisier and noisier. Scientists have found that this noisiness has caused some songbirds to change the way they talk to each other. In one study, researchers listened to recordings of white-crowned sparrows in San Francisco. These were first made starting in 1969. The researchers recorded sparrows living right in the middle of the city. Then, in 2005, they recorded the same type of sparrows living in the same parts of the city. And they discovered something amazing. In 1969, the sparrows sang at a lower pitch. But in 2005, the birds were singing the same song, but at a higher pitch. Low pitch. High pitch. It might sound like a small change, but the songs are definitely different. Scientists think that this is because of us. The city got much bigger in the 36 years since the first recordings. More buildings were built, more people moved in, more cars and buses on the road. The birds had to change their song to be heard above all the ruckus. The scientists also discovered that the sparrows were not only singing higher, they were also singing louder. Just like you might have to shout to a friend to be heard over a busy street, the sparrows have to shout too. Many city noises, like traffic, are lower pitched. So by singing at a higher pitch, it's easier for the sparrows to cut through the noise. Some songbirds have even changed their tweets to work around our schedules. The researchers noticed that some sparrows would avoid singing during rush hour because the cars were too loud. They compared their findings to white-crowned sparrows who lived out in the country, and they found that since 1969, these birds barely had any changes to the volume or pitch of their songs. So the quiet country life is really good for the songbirds. Yeah, I bet it's exhausting to shout all the time. I feel bad for them. Maybe we could get them some little bird-sized microphones. Then they might start a bird podcast. I would love to hear that. Me too. So, there's one more really interesting thing about this. Researchers found something cool in 2020. When most places shut down at the start of the COVID pandemic, scientists had a rare chance to see how songbirds behaved when cities suddenly got quieter. They collected information on the same white-crowned sparrows in San Francisco that were part of the earlier study. And they found that without all the traffic on the roads or people gathering in the city, the sparrows didn't have to shout anymore. The sparrows in the city began singing softer and at a lower pitch. Some of them even sounded incredibly similar to the country songbirds who never had to deal with city noise. While songbirds don't have a tweet for every word, 
They do use sound to communicate. Bird calls are short sounds that could mean a bird sees a predator or has found a tasty snack. Songbirds sing longer songs when they're trying to attract a mate, or sometimes just for fun. And just like human babies try to copy their parents, chicks usually learn most of their singing skills by imitating their parents. Songbirds can't understand everything the birds of other species say, but they can sometimes recognize alerts for food or danger. And we humans are changing how birds sing too. They're learning to imitate our phones or machines, and some birds are singing louder and higher to be heard over all the noise we make. That's it for this episode of Brains On. This episode was produced by Molly Bloom, Anna Goldfield, Molly Quinlan, Rosie Dupont, Aron Woldis Lossi, Anna Weggle, Nico Gonzalez Whistler, Ruby Guthrie, and Mark Sanchez. Our editors are Sandin Totten and Shayla Farzan. This episode was sound designed by Rachel Breeze. Beth Perlman is our executive producer. The executives in charge of APM Studios are Chandra Kavati, Alex Schaffer, and Joanne Griffith. We had engineering help from Roberto Chacon and Michael Osborne. Brains On is a nonprofit public radio program. There are lots of ways to support the show. Head to brainson.org. While you're there, you can send in your mystery sounds, questions, and drawings. You can also subscribe to our Smarty Pass. Super fun, ad-free episodes and bonus stuff just for you. Okay, Bessie, are you ready to listen to the mystery sound again? Yes. Okay, here it is. Yeah, I still think that's a drill. It's a drill? Yeah, it does kind of sound like construction stuff. All right, you ready for the answer? Yeah. All right, here it is. Hi, my name is Dia. My name is Alia. And we're from Millbury, New Jersey. That was the sound of us opening and closing our blinds. Oh. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Oh. So I guess the like zippy noise was like the sound of the, the string being pulled up and the blind going up. Yeah. And then the big noise was it coming down again, I think. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Probably. Do you have blinds at your house? Yeah, but they're not that noisy. <laughs> you have quieter blinds. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. We'll be back next week with more answers to your questions. Thanks for listening.